from Microbe TV. This is Immune, episode number 49, recorded on October 11th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hi. I never know when to say whether to say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. So how about good day? Then I think I feel like I sound Australian. <laughs> That's universal, yeah. But it's morning. I mean, you're on the same time zone as I am. So yeah, it yeah, morning. it's morning here. Also joining us from Durham, North Carolina, Steph Langle. Hey there. Good to be back. Um, Gosh, we're into October already. Mid-October. Time flies by. It sure does. does. (laughs) Here the leaves are falling. Yes. And from not here. Not there yet? (laughs) Not yet. I remember once we drove from New Jersey to Florida and you could see it getting greener and greener as you went south. It was really cool. Mm-hmm. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to see everyone. Uh, it's nice to be back. We are on the at the end of our fall break right now. Um, so it's been nice to have a little time off. This is the first immune from the incubator. Ooh. Yay! I'll explain what that is in a moment. We have a guest today from the University of Utah School of Medicine, Kiki Fairfax. Welcome to Immune. Hello, and it is definitely morning here. <laughs> yes, you're you're, you're an <laughs> hour behind. behind. Is it one hour behind us or two? Two hours. Two hours. Yeah. I cannot get time zones straight. Uh, anyway. Um, uh, in the Zoom era, I've been late to things because yeah. I did not have the time zones correct. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, all of us have been. Uh, the Zoom is great yeah. for being able to connect, but you got to get... Last night, I did a Zoom with someone in the Philippines. Wow. And it was 8... I did it at 8 p.m. and it was 8 a.m. for them. Oh, wow. You know what the funny thing was? She was a college student, I think, and she had chickens in her house. That's that's um, kind of really that talking about one health, right? Oh, so I mean, when you, that's they, really common, though. Um, yeah, yeah. So right. my family is from the British Virgin Islands, and there are chickens everywhere. Chickens, yeah. goats, huh. free range. So right. she apologized because they ever happen in your life. They clucked throughout the whole. I thought it was fascinating. Cool. Uh, anyway, um, Kiki, we're going to talk about your work today, which uh, we love. But first, we want to hear a little bit about uh, your history. You know, where you were. You just told us where you're from, but uh, where you were educated and trained, and so forth. Uh, Sure. So I grew up in Michigan. Um, I did my undergrad at the University of Chicago, um, which was the best college experience I could ever ask for. I loved UFC. Um, I did my PhD at Yale in microbial pathogenesis. Um, And that's where I fell in love with worms. Uh, Before that, I did bacterial pathogenesis. Um, Who did you do your PhD with? Michael Capello. He's in Mm -hmm. pediatrics. Um, and so he was my second rotation and I fell in love with worms. Um, and I haven't looked back. Um, and then I did my postdoc with, uh, Ed Pierce. Um, and I started with Ed when he was moving from UPenn to Trudeau. Um, and then we were at Trudeau Institute for two years and then he moved to Wash U. Um, and I moved to Wash U with him. Um, and I stayed with him another two years. And then I moved to Gwen Randolph's lab also Mm -hmm. at Wash U. Mm -hmm. Uh, to transition to independence. Um, and that's where my independent career began in earnest uh, as an instructor. Um, and then I got a tenure track position at Purdue University and started my lab there in 2014. Um, and then I moved my lab to the University of Utah in 2018. So how did you get interested in science uh, to start with? Were you, you know, when you were oh. an undergrad, were you starting in science or? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I've been doing science for a very long time. Um, so I knew I wanted to be a scientist from the time I was five or six. And I used to do experiments in the backyard with worms and roly polies. Oh, wow. Um, and Jane Goodall <laughs> was my hero. I worshipped Jane Goodall. Oh, wow. And I actually either wanted to be a paleontologist or a primatologist. Um I also was obsessed with dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> I still love dinosaurs and 
now that my kids are obsessed with dinosaurs, it's really great. <laughs> um, but, um, so no, I've always wanted to be a scientist. Uh, it just took me a while to find uh, what scientist I wanted to be. And so I started doing um, university level research in high school uh, through a program that still exists today called HSHSP at Michigan State University. Um, and so I spent- What does that stand for? Uh, high you remember? school <laughs> science- Honors program and research, I think. I don't. Sounds right. I'm not, sounds right. Not hundred percent sure. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. You're, I'm, I'm digging back twenty five years <laughs> in my brain, uh, okay. but actually, Gail Richmond still runs it. And actually, we connected um, seven years ago on on LinkedIn. Um, she's she's really fabulous, and she's uh, trained a lot of scientists. Um, but yeah, that's when I started doing university level research. Um, one science fair. Um, won the uh, Junior Science and Humanities Symposium that's sponsored by the Army, Navy, and Marines. Um, And I came in third the first time that I did that. Um, And then second, my second year, but then the first place winner had to step down. So I was the international representative uh, in London. Uh, That's cool. (laughs) After my senior year in high school. so I've been doing science a long time, been talking about science a long time. Um, and yeah, I fell in love with pathogenesis um, uh, via a Michael Crichton book, actually, when I was about 12 mm. or 13. Um, and that's when I really got into pathogens. Um, and so, what, what but book, I did, what I did book? back there. What is it? Uh, what is it? The hot zone? What is that? Um, I think no. it's hot zone. The Andromeda strain? Yeah. Oh, it was Andromeda Strain, yes. Yeah. yeah. It was I Andromeda Strain first. But I've also yep. read The Hot Zone, but that was, you know, when I was in college. Um, but Andromeda Strain was old. Let me see what year it came out. I don't like not knowing these things. <laughs> um, my memory, 71. It came out in 71. Yeah. So uh, I read that. Um, I don't know what grade I would have been in. But it was definitely before I was 13. Um and that's when I knew I wanted to do pathogenesis. I tried other stuff. So at Michigan State, I did endocrinology uh, and toxicology. Um, the endocrinology was actually hormones, which is like full circle back to what Yeah, it's very full circle, but, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was actually looking at the effects of uh, uh, hormones on mating behavior in uh, zebra finches and anole lizards. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, the... My second year, I was trying to come up with an antioxidant mix to improve boar sperm preservation, which is the hardest sperm to preserve, (laughs) Um, (laughs) but is absolutely essential for uh, our agricultural industry is to be able to ship sperm. Um, Anyways, that was my second project. So I've actually sort of always been doing reproduction without really being... (laughs) aware of it. Actually, everything I do ties together, right? So my PhD was on on hookworms and it was actually only one third immunology, two thirds biochemistry, but it was fatty acid binding proteins. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, And so I'm back to fats. I'm back (laughs) to the effect of hormones on metabolism. Um, And yeah. Oh, wow. Well, tell us how you got hooked on worms and maybe that would lead us. (laughs) Uh That's a good title. Hooked on worms. I was thinking about that too. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And maybe that would lead us to learning a little bit about your pathogen of interest, particularly the pathogen that you've recently published on. Uh, sure. Um, so like I said, I did um, my second rotation uh, in Mike Capello's lab. Uh, and that rotation project um, was just uh, anticoagulants, which he mm. um, he has a patent for Uh, hookworm anticoagulants uh, that are actually the best anticoagulants ever discovered. Um, And uh, so that was the first project. And it was really, I've always had, like I said, an interest in pathogenesis, but I've always had a desire to serve humanity. Um, And that was really the first lab where I could see a large scale difference, right? And so my first rotation was in a Pseudomonas aeruginosa lab. Um, And as an undergrad, I worked on uh, Pseudomonas syringae. Um, 
And the lab I first rotated in, uh, Barbara Kazmierczak's lab, was actually collaborating with my lab at University of Chicago. Um, and so it was actually assumed that that was where I would end up. Um, and that was very interesting to me. And that does have an impact. Um, cystic fibrosis right. you know, is a horrible right. disease. Um, but it's a very small number of people, right? Um, and with worms, you're talking about improving the lives of billions of people, right? right? Um, you're, you know, depending on how wide ranging, whatever it is you come up with in terms of how many, how many species it covers, you're anywhere up to 20% of the world's population, right? Right. And that's a huge impact, right? Huge. Um, and so that was a huge part of the draw of worms for me. Um, the other part is, I am incredibly intellectually curious um, and I like a challenge <laughs> and no offense to bacteria and viruses, but they're easy. They're really easy. <laughs> They've got a few genes. They have a few genes. It's not complicated. Um, and very importantly, literally we've developed dozens of vaccines that can induce sterile immunity or very close to sterile immunity. That's never happening with worms, right? And so if you want a lifelong challenge, worms is the place to worms be. Worms is the place. <laughs> wow. And so what about that challenge? What What is it about? Um, I, I know very little about worms, but is it the life cycle? Is it the sheer diversity of worms? All, all the above? Oh, it's everything. Um, <laughs> so I actually, and I found out uh, a little while ago that this is rare. I actually operate my lab under a theory, um, which other conversations that I've had recently with scientists, we've been bemoaning um, the loss of theory in, in a lot of what we do, right? And so the theory I operate my lab on is uh, evolutionary co-adaptation, hmm. right? Um, and so I view everything through the lens of billions of years of evolutionary interaction between helminths and what would eventually become mammalians, right? And so there have been helminth parasites since jawed fishes. Right. Um, and so viewing that lens, I see them less as a pathogen and more as microbiota, right? right? Um, <clears throat> and so they still do some really bad things. And I'm not saying I want to infect everybody in the world with worms. Uh, let me be clear on that. <laughs> I still think it's bad if you're four years old and infected with schistosomiasis. Right. Um, but uh, just a disclaimer on the episode. Right. <laughs> um, but we actually get a lot of benefits from that long uh, history of adaptation. And very importantly, to a large degree, our immune system requires that sort of input in order to function properly, right? And so I'm interested both in pathogenesis from a pure standpoint um, and alleviating uh, a, a pathological symptoms. But I'm also, in, to some degree, the older I get, the more interested I am in, um, in, in understanding that benefit side, right? Um, and so I view worms as the absolute best tool to understand the evolution of human immunity and mammalian immunity, um, and to understand how we can modulate that system. Um, because we no longer are in a situation where everybody is infected with four helmets. Um, right. you know, they've get five bacterial infections <laughs> every three months. Um, you know, that just doesn't happen anymore, right? Um, we're way too clean. Um, and so understanding the situation under which we evolved to act, um, I think is the only way forward to, to really addressing immunopathologies. So can you tell us a little bit more about worms? Like how do you get them? How do they develop? And what kind of immune response do they generate? Oh, that the answer to that is very varied. Uh, so people <laughs> tend to think of um, helminths as a one-size-fits-all box. And that's mm -hmm. just absolutely not true, right? So uh, we have nematodes, 
which is what most people think of when they think about worms. Hmm. Um, and so for human pathogens, that would be ascaris. Um, hookworms or a nematode. Right. Um, we have trematodes. Um, and the largest trematode pathogen for humans is schistosoma species. Right. Um, and there are there are three main, um, but there are other species that can infect humans. And now we actually have the problem of hybrids, um, which are hmm. originated as hybrids of um, bovis, which is a, a, a cow pathogen, um, and mansoni, as well as hematobium. Um, and they're actually more pathogenic and able to infect both cows and humans, which gets us to the situation close to what we have with japonicum, which is a nat- natural pathogen of both humans and uh, water buffalo. Uh-huh. Um, and water buffalo serves as a reservoir for uh, Schistosoma japonicum in Southeast Asia and the Philippines. Um, and then we also have tapeworms, which uh, lots of people make jokes about tapeworms. Um, uh, but, um, uh, you know, they're relatively on the scale pathologically inert um, in terms of long-term immunopathology. Um, and, you know, in, in most of um, the Western world, uh, unheard of as long as meat as, is screened properly. Um, so for uh, nematodes, there are soil transmitted helmets, um, and that is a fecal oral or a skin penetration, um, depending on the species. Um, and for the human hookworms, there are some that can infect only orally and some that can infect both orally and via skin uh, penetration. Um, and that's usually at the foot, uh, with people walking barefoot. Um, then there, there's other nematodes that are only oral transmission, um, ascaris. Um, uh, so schistosomes, uh, has to be skin penetration and it's waterborne, not soil transmitted. Um, and so they actually have an intermediate host. Um, hookworms don't have an intermediate host. It's a direct life cycle. Um, but schistosomes have an intermediate host and those are freshwater snails. Oh, wow. Um, And so uh, eggs, when they're excreted by a human or a cow, um, have to hatch in the water and they hatch into myricidia. um, And the myricidia um, swim and penetrate snail tissue and infect the snails. Um, And then in the snail, they have to undergo thousands of rounds of asexual reproduction um, before they can become infectious cercari, which are infectious to mammals. Um, And so they break out of the snail in response to light, um, heat, um, and usually when the snail is closer to the surface of the water. Um, And then they seek out a host uh, following a lot of cues. We know one of them is CO2, um, Hmm. but there are other chemotactic cues that they follow to to find a mammal. Um, And then they penetrate the skin. Okay, so I have a question. <laughs> um, so you have some work that we we took a look at about mm-hmm. like using schistosome and mansoni. And what I'm trying to imagine based on what you just told us is how you do some of those experiments in the lab. You know, how oh, do you nice. actually culture the schistosomes? Do you have a snail culture? How we do, do you have, have them? Oh wow! How do you have them actually get into the mouse um, <laughs> or into the the host tissue? I, that okay. that part I can't imagine at all. That's the easy part. Um, so I take a shortcut and I do not do the full life cycle myself. We have done it. It's a pain in the butt. Um, the NIH pays a schistosome core oh, at nice. BRI, uh, in Bethesda, um, to provide exposed snails to people. They also provide a lot of other things. They'll ship you infected mice. Um, uh, and so we get snails on a weekly basis. We get about a hundred a week. Um, that have been exposed to a low number of myricidia. Um, and that low level infection will usually allow them to shed five to six times on average before they die. Um, and so we get the snails before they're prepatent. Um, and so those rounds of asexual reproduction and differentiation that happen in the intermediate host um, take four to five weeks. Um, and so we get them a week after they're exposed. And then um, it's another four to five weeks with us before uh, they're shedding a decent number of cercari. Um, they have to be shed twice a week or else the cercari build up in the snail and will kill the snail. Oh, wow. Um, and so we keep them in dark, 24 hours of dark, so we don't get 
uh, spontaneous shedding. Um, and I have a incubator. It's a modified insect chamber, actually, um, uh, made to my specifications. Um, and so we keep them in there um, in corningware dishes. Um, and they eat lettuce. Actually, most people wow. ask what yeah, they <laughs> They're very picky. They will only eat romaine lettuce. Oh, wow. <laughs> when we had uh, that romaine shortage last year because of the salmonella outbreak, it was dire because wow. you can try five other types of lettuce and the snails will be just be like, no, thanks. No, <laughs> um, and they won't eat it. Uh, we do, they do have a second food, which uh, is a snail jello we make. Um, snail uh, jello, wow. <laughs> yeah, it, it actually, it's, it looks like jello uh, cool. because you, <laughs> you, uh, we use uh, calcium chloride and um, uh, sodium alginate to uh, solidify it, but it's uh, barley grass, uh, tropical fish flakes, um, <laughs> wheat germ. Um, it's very healthy for the snails. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they eat that and romaine lettuce, um, which is the only lettuce they have a taste for. I'm guessing it tastes like the uh, seaweed that they would normally be eating in freshwater lakes. Um, but uh, so we shed them once they're patent twice a week. Um, and the way we infect snails is that we shed them into the, um, we shed them in the smallest volume of water possible because we're trying to get uh, the stercari to the highest concentration possible, which will allow us to have high dose infections. Um, but uh, so we put the snails in a very low volume of water and then they go under, um, and this is getting harder and harder to find. It has to be an incandescent, at least 60 watt light bulb to produce enough heat and enough of the correct spectrum of light for them to shed. Wow. Um, I don't know what we're going to do when we completely get rid of incandescent light. I don't know how it's going to work. Oh, that's fascinating. But, um, and so that's 45 minutes under the light and then they go back in the dark for 15 minutes. Um, and then we filter the water and the spicari swim through the filter and you're trying to get the snail tissue debris because they do, the snails lose tissue every time the, the circari mm -hmm. breaks out. Um, and then we count and we infect using these custom made stainless steel rings. Um, there are two ways you can infect. This is my preferred way to infect. Um, so we anesthetize the mice. They're taped down um, onto the surface of the BSL-2 hood um, with this uh, stainless steel ring on their belly. Um, and it's flat, so it uh, makes a seal on the skin. Um, and then we add the liquid to the ring. Um, the other way you can affect is by tail dipping. And so you dip the tail into a tube that has the circari. Oh, uh, that was um, related to the question I had regarding they penetrate the skin. Do they need an abrasion or micro cuts no. or no, they can just directly enter. Yeah. Okay. So for, for the mouse, we shave, uh, for the belly, we shave the fur because it just makes it easier to get a tight seal. Um, because with the fur there, um, you can have the water beat up, right? Um, and they, they need it you have to break the surface tension and they have to be able to, to go in. If you imagine normally a person would be in the water, right? right. Mm -hmm. And so you wouldn't have uh, that layer of surface tension and there would be no friction for the circari to go through the skin, right? From the water. Um, and so that's the, what you're trying to mimic is that state. Do they go into the hair follicles actually, or this any, just anywhere in the skin? Um, there has actually been work on this. Uh, they do like hair follicles, but they don't have to have a follicle to go through. Okay. Wow. And we thought we had it easy or thought we had it hard <laughs> with like culturing viruses and we're passaging them. But no, this is, this is a whole different ballgame. No. And they're, they're sensitive to the type of water. I'll tell you when I moved to Utah, I, I used to be able to both in Indiana and St. Louis um, filter water um, and use tap water filtered. Um, and the mineral content here at high altitude isn't correct. Um, so we can't use filtered water. Um, so I ship in on a weekly basis, Poland Springs water, which is bottled at low altitude in Maine and has the right minimal, mineral, mineral mix. Um, yeah, these snails are living the high life. I'm yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Was that something that you anticipated from your move from Purdue nope. to Utah? Nope. Okay. I didn't know if that was <laughs> a surprise. surprise. <laughs> you know, I had my filter installed and I'm like, why are we not getting good circari counts? <laughs> um, and so then I'm like, okay, it's got to be something in the water. So then there is this water mixture you can make if you start from ultra pure water. It's called lepel water. It was uh, discovered in the, the 70s. Um, 
And uh, that wasn't working. And I was like, what in the world? Right. So I, I talked to, I've got lots of Shisto friends. Um, <laughs> I'm talking to all my Shisto friends and Margaret's like, you know, every other person that's had trouble um, with water, they've been fine with Poland spring. Right. Wow. So I was like, all right, I'm going to spend a lot of money and buy a pulse of Poland spring water. Um, and uh, it worked. And so that's what I've just stuck with. Wow. Yeah. First, incredible. First, first people who it's actually want impressive. Poland spring water. <laughs> Yeah, that's so interesting. Uh, yeah, actually, it's my uh, my grad student Lisa. It's her preferred water to drink. She grew up yeah. in New Jersey and she loves Poland yeah, Spring. We, water. It's everywhere here in the offices when you get those big water tanks. Yep. It's yeah. Poland Spring. It's yeah. hard to get on the West Coast. Oh. Um, <laughs> it's actually uh, it's they have a second name for it, Rocky Mountain or something like that. Hmm. Um, water. It's the same company, but it's actually bottled at a different location, and that water doesn't work. Um, and so when I first moved here, none of the stores in town had real Poland Springs water. They only had this Rocky Mountain. And if you signed up for the delivery service, all you could get was the Rocky Mountain. And the minerals are actually not the same. Um, and so we, I, I, I order via Amazon in bulk through our business account. Um, but it wastes a lot of plastic and I feel bad about it. Um, but I don't have a choice because nothing else right. works. Right, right. <laughs> Wow. Um, Lisa and the snails, both preferring Poland Springs. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, not only are you working on, obviously, this difficult pathogen in terms of reproducing the reproductive cycle in the lab, but then you're also working with a difficult mouse model, the pregnant mouse yes. model, so pregnancy. Yes. Um, Very hard. It is challenging. And I was curious if you could speak to schistosomiasis infections during pregnancy. Why is it important? Why did you want to start studying that? And then marrying these two difficult models together. How did that work? Yes. Um, so I'm a masochist. And uh, <laughs> so I do experiments that other people are not willing to do um, because they're a pain in the butt and very frustrating. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to say that on the outset as people think that they can very easily set up pregnancy models of their own. It's hard. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, maternal schistosomiasis, we've known is a huge global health problem for over 20 years. Right. Um, and so it's multi-factor. Um, and so on the mom side, um, anemia is higher um, when a woman is infected with any helminth um, or malaria uh, and then becomes pregnant, they're more likely to have severe anemia. Um, parasitic infections in the mother um, correlate with uh, interuterine growth restriction um, on the, the extreme um, and on, on the more milder, uh, just low birth weight. Right. Um, and so that's on the, you know, overall outcomes. Um, there also is a correlation with first trimester miscarriages, but not third trimester um, for, for schistosoma. Um, for malaria, there are uh, late term spontaneous uh, abortions, but that doesn't seem to occur, um, at least in Africa, uh, with uh, schistosomiasis. There are some hints that it could um, in South America. But, um, but most of the data uh, is coming out of Sub-Saharan Africa um, and then in Southeast Asia with Japonicum. Um, and so those are, those are the gross factors. Um, the more subtle factors that really became apparent about 15 years ago um, is lower uh, vaccine efficacy. Um, and that first finding was with BCG efficacy. Um, which in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia is, is given uh, essentially at birth, right? Or it's within the first couple of weeks of life. Is this um, in the, the baby or in the mother? In the baby. Okay. In the baby. And so if children are born to um, helminth-infected mothers, um, this is also true for malaria, or malaria-infected mothers, um, and then they're uh, inoculated with BCG, right? Given a BCG scar. Um, they produce less interferon gamma on restimulation, which is the key protective component of BCG immunization. Um, and they are more likely to get uh, a TB infection. Um, and TB schisto co-infections um, have very high uh, morbidity. Um, 
And so that was the first finding. Uh, subsequent studies have also shown reduced long-term um, anti-measles titers, um, as well as reduced efficacy of um, diphtheria. But it depends on the country and it depends on the study. Um, and there do seem to be some differences between uh, hematobium mancini and japonicum. Uh, one thing that is constant uh, is BCG. Um, but the, the measles and the diphtheria have wider variability. Um, the caveats to that is that very few of these women are mono-infected. Um, so most of them are infected with multiple worms. And so teasing out direct relationships uh, with specific species is very difficult. There have been a couple of studies um, where there were uh, mono mancini infected uh, women or mono hematobium infected women. Um, but uh, the, the size of, of those studies, once you're, once you're down to mono infected, um, it's really hard to, to suss out anything other than the most extreme uh, outcomes. Um, but the, the effect on long-term measles immunity uh, was found in, in one of those uh, by a really good colleague of mine uh, who is now retired, much deserved retirement, Dan Colley. Um, uh, so, you know, there has been evidence in the literature for a very long time. Um, the caveat to all of that work is that it's not a lot of detailed cellular immunity. Um, these studies are very hard to do. Right. And, you know, it's very hard to figure out the right outcome measure. Um, and that was really my driving factor when I first started my lab, um, you know, and that's when I decided I was going to do maternal schistosomiasis is when I became independent. I had been interested in it for a while. Um, and so my driver was to develop a mouse model that would allow me to come up with better outcome measures that we could then put back into humans and hopefully mechanistically understand what's going on so we could try to figure out how to fix it. So what are the main mechanisms that you're exploring that might account for this? Ah, okay. So there's what I thought when I started this work and what we know now. Which is <laughs> <laughs> and that's science, right? Right. Um, yeah. Right. So uh, my main hypothesis, uh, and, you know, I got an R01 funded off of this <laughs> hypothesis. Uh, and it was, it's not actually wrong. It's just, it's more complicated than this. Right. Um, and I didn't <laughs> think right. how complicated it was. Um, so uh, if we go back in time, um, I do a lot of work on uh, vaccine induced immunity in general, right? And understanding the interplay between B cells and T cells and stromal cells for developing optimal vaccine-induced immunity, right? So based on all of that work, my hypothesis was um, I knew that particularly, and I started with tetanus diphtheria um, as Tdap is one of the earliest administered vaccines after BCG in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and that's administered at six weeks. Um, and so I know for uh, optimal immunity following TD immunization, um, you want the largest percentage of your T follicular helper cells to co-produce IL-4 and IL-21. Um, and there's, you have to induce a population that we call TFH memory cells. Other people call them different things. This is one of the problems with immunology, but I call them <laughs> TFH memory cells. Um, and these are IL-7 receptor high. They've opened up the IL-4 loci when you're talking about a type 2 response. Um, they still have very high CXCR5 expression, um, but they downregulate PD-1 and they're able to circulate in the blood. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so work that I published uh, back in 2015 demonstrated that this population of TFH memory cells um, was the most efficient at coming back into a germinal center um, and kicking off a secondary TFH cell response, which was optimal and needed um, to stimulate memory B cells to differentiate into plasma cells in a secondary response, right? And that rapid re-stimulation is what it's actually protective, not your circulating long-lived plasma cells. We really need to generate newer, more efficient plasma cells from memory B cells. Um, 
And this is important. I think this is something that's lost in people's understanding of vaccine-induced immunity is that it's not just about your antibody titers at like 90 days after immunization. It's really about your memory B cells. (laughs) Um, thank you thank you thank you has that come up ever on any of our other podcasts yeah yeah, it sounds familiar it does kind of sound familiar (laughs) sorry and i know other people are beating this drum right i i see deepta constantly on twitter being like don't forget about the memory b cells guys yeah um so uh i'm a memory b cell fan um so that that fundamental understanding of what is needed for a secondary response, right? Which is when you think about protection induced by early childhood immunization, you're looking at what is able to generate a secondary response, right? right? Um, And so that understanding is what formed the basis of the hypothesis for that grant. And so my hypothesis was that um, there is inappropriate generation of these TFH uh, precursors and the memory B cells in (coughs) offspring born to schistosome infected mothers. Now, where I was wrong was that I assumed that they actually inappropriately overproduced IL-4 and weren't surviving. Um, And that wasn't just my hypothesis. That was the leading hypothesis in the field from all the human work. Hmm. And it was logical if you think that schistosomes induce a lot of IL-4 production, which they do. And so uh, that was the hypothesis. Um, And so that grant was funded to understand homeostatic immunity um, in pups born to schistosome infected mothers, um, you know, the organization of the lymph node, how the stromal cell compartment is altered, um, B cell follicles, um, and then uh, how immunity to either type one or type two stimulating immunization is altered in these offspring. And then AIM-3, which is a crap AIM, I'm going to be honest, it was actually the only AIM reviewers didn't like. (laughs) One reviewer actually said this would be a one grant. It was a two grant. This would be a one grant. (laughs) Oh no. (laughs) Darn that Um, AIM-3. But it was was still funded. So I actually still haven't done AIM-3 and I probably never will. But but AIM-3 was about uh, prosequantal treating um, the mother's uh, before mating. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of problems in parent in the shortness of pregnancy in the murine model for yeah, why this sure. is a bad aim. Uh, it's actually a really good aim for humans, but it's a bad aim for, for, for mice. But, uh, that that'll be a discussion for another day. Um, Just um, to, uh, yeah. so could you rework that aim for another model? Uh, um, I mean, obviously rhesus macaques are very expensive or rabbits or <laughs> something else. <laughs> um, no, we actually just have a different way we're going to answer that question. And okay. I can get to that at the end. Cool. Um, but I, there, I think there's a better way to answer that question based on, you know, being restricted to 19 days of pregnancy. Right. So um so, so though that was the hypothesis of the grant, right? Uh, what we found out really early on is these offspring actually underproduce IL-4. Wow. Um, and that's both at steady state um, as well as after immunization. Um, and that that underproduction of IL-4 is what disrupts the lymphocyte mm-hmm. stromal cell axis in the peripheral lymph nodes. Could you tell us um, how you... Uh, to do that? Like what's the timing of, of infection and pregnancy? Oh yeah. So, um, all right. So we mate our girls. Um, we infect them very early. Uh, so you can infect mice uh, as early as six weeks of age. Um, we cannot infect them much later than about nine weeks of age and actually have them be able to have offspring. Hmm. Um, so we infect them between six and nine weeks of age. Um, and then at about uh, five weeks, four and a half to five weeks post-infection is when we pair them for the first time. If they're paired late, so if they're paired when they're already in chronic infection, we don't get pups ever. Hmm. But if they get pregnant the first time during acute infection, then most girls will reliably have litters. And we have girls that we have taken, we've had their last litter at 26, 28 weeks of infection, which is fairly far into chronic infection in the murine model. Um, and so we're able to get, you know, really good moms. We get six litters. Is that true oh, also right. in, in humans that the, if you're infected, that 
you, you wouldn't be able to give Fertility birth. is lower. Um, so ah. this is a very hard question to answer in humans, right? So yeah. there is one really good paper that have look, has looked at the effects of helmets on fertility um, across a wide variety of helmets. Um, and that has shown that for most helmets, fertility is reduced. There are a couple of helmets for which fertility is enhanced, but for most helmets, fertility is reduced. Um, and that is the case with schistosomes as well. And that's with all three schistosome species. Um, the mechanisms for that are obvious for hematobium, where you actually have deposition of eggs at the cervix, mm. right? Um, and so those mechanisms are a little more conceptually obvious. Um, for what's going on in Japonicum and Mansoni, that's a whole other question. And I don't know that I want to go down that wormhole. But we do <laughs> know that fertility is reduced. Um, Speaking to the the theory of your lab, and this is something we yes. can answer at the end because we want to make sure to get to your uh, these great papers. <laughs> but what do you think the evolutionary um, story is with pregnancy, helmets, fertility, and and this <laughs> decrease in efficacy? To <laughs> sorry, uh, is it a painful question? But it's that is so a very fascinating. painful question. Um, so, cause I don't want to actually experimentally answer this question. I've only put a modest amount of thought into it, but we do actually know that there is an interplay between hormones, um, and schistosome antigens. Mm -hmm. Um, we know that schistosomes, um, actually make, uh, androgen receptor mimics, um, that are where uh, human or murine um, testosterone or estrogen is able to bind. Um, it's quite possible that they also secrete um, homologs of testosterone and estrogen that hasn't been pursued as widely. Um, but there is a lot of similarity in a lot of signaling molecules between schistosomes and mammals, right? The most studied is the TGF beta pathway. Um, of course, and um, Ed in his early days did a lot of work on that, as, as did a lot of other people. Um, uh, we also know uh, schistosomes require host IL-7 um, in order to develop into adults. Um, and so, uh, they, so they, they use the, the IL-7 receptor signaling path ways. Um, and so there is a lot of overlap in signaling molecules between schistosomes and mammals. Um, and so that may be part of it. Um, but you know, that's a rabbit hole. I, I don't want to go down understanding the, the regulation of, of hormones and, uh, and epigenetic epigenetic reprogramming is, is as far down that rabbit hole wow. as I can go right it's now. A, is it a Based rabbit on, hole or a wormhole? Years, I'll change my mind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was good, Vincent. Wormhole. Yeah. So I was, yeah. Is it a rabbit hole or a wormhole? You've used both terms. Oh, <laughs> I have, I have, and I don't use rabbits. <laughs> Well, based on um, um, your paper on macrophage metabolic reprogramming yes. and epigen it may be only a few years down the road when you have to enter that wormhole. I don't know. Um, no, <laughs> we're already in that wormhole in the maternal oh, model. Okay. This is finishing right. up a paper. And this oh, is where I said oh. where the, the truth is actually more complicated. So um, the, the paper we published in February did demonstrate effects on peripheral um, lymphocytes, right? Both T cells and B cells, although we focused the paper on B cells, um, the TFH is, are, are clearly defective in, uh, proliferation. Um, and, uh, and, and type two, uh, memory cells, memory T cells are impaired. Um, and, and so that is a hundred percent true. Um, it's just, we now know that it's far more basal than that. Um, and so Lisa's current paper that she's finishing up experiments on, um, we've demonstrated that B cell hematopoiesis is altered, um, in the bone marrow. Um, and we stumbled upon that, um, wasn't really stumbling, uh, but we came upon that, uh, with a congruence of, of two things. Then the first was, uh, the last figure in that plus pathogens paper from February, uh, we was well, second to last figure. Um, we did single cell RNA seq in the periphery, and um, and one of the most striking things was that every cluster of um, follicular B cells was altered in the same way um, in terms of reduced EBF one and reduced cell cycle capacity. Um, and so, to me, 
that alteration couldn't have been happening at the periphery. I, I Conceptually, I had a hard time imagining that these B cells were perfectly fine and then they got to the lymph node, right? Um, and at the same time, uh, we have this other story uh, in myeloid cells um, where we were starting to have, and we now have very good evidence, we were starting to have evidence that uh, myelopoiesis is reprogrammed um, again, at the progenitor level, um, and that this is long lived in the absence of antigen. Because in that paper, which we published in January, um, we could make bone marrow chimeras, and 10 weeks after chimeras were made into an uninfected mouse, we still have the same phenotype mm -hmm. of new macrophages being generated. Um, and so those two pieces of evidence coming together is what started Lisa looking at um, B cell hematopoiesis. Um, and it is greatly dysregulated. Um, I don't want to give away her paper. Um, so <laughs> we do know the mechanism. I'm not going to tell you what the mechanism is. Okay. Well, um, that'll be a TBD. We are, we'll look forward to seeing that yeah. when it's out. Yeah. Um, we're, we're really hoping um, she, we're just redoing a pull down now. Mm -hmm. Um, but we, we have identified, um, an RNA regulatory mechanism that, mm -hmm. uh, is acting epigenetically. Um, and, and, uh, that reprogramming is, is happening really early on in B cell hematopoiesis, um, actually at the, the CLP level, um, before you even develop mm -hmm. into B cells. Wow. Um, and so both positive and negative selection are altered. Um, and then it appears that that same mechanism then continues into the periphery um, and alters uh, the ability to uh, differentiate and proliferate in response to BCRQs once you're, once you're in the peripheral lymph nodes. So we've tied together the peripheral defects with um, this hematopoietic reprogramming. Um, and, you know, six years ago when I started writing that grant, I had no idea. No. <laughs> Do you want? Do you know the parasite driver of these changes? Do you want to oh, know? Oh, that's a whole nother question. I got a whole nother grant for that. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, not on the that's that grant isn't funded on the maternal side. It's funded on the metabolism side. But we have an R twenty one for antigen discovery to oh find the antigens that are capable of reprogramming progenitors, and we're yeah. working on that now. Yeah. So I guess my question is sort of related, um, and it might be slightly. Uh, related to the painful question earlier as well. Um, <laughs> you talked a little bit about um, the sort of evolution and the impact on fertility, but I'm wondering what's different in the mom? Is it an aspect of mom's immune response? Is it an aspect of mom's metabolism that is leading to this change in the baby? Because um, I could imagine that could be something we could try to modulate. And we're actually yeah. working on that now. Um, and so that original grant was not funded to find maternal factors. Mm. But, um, but it's the question we're interested in moving into human work. Um, and I will say uh, I have pilot funding along with three other good friends who are also PIs um, here. Uh, and we're, we're very close to finishing up that pilot project to uh, submit a, a program project grant um, there. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm actually interested in expanding this work beyond schistosomes. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is uh, work with uh, Matt Williams and Scott Hale, who are both influenza experts but don't do pregnancy. Um, and then Anna Bowden, who is an expert in hematopoiesis. Um, as well as does other uh, pregnancy models of inflammation and infection. Um, and so the four of us together are, are interested in understanding what is inflammatory driven um, and, and constant versus what is antigen driven. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, what are the maternal factors versus um, what is actually being transferred to offspring. Um, that's as vaguely as I can answer that question without telling you uh, all aims of all four <laughs> projects. Um, but well, uh, I'm, I'm intrigued. I think it sounds so cool. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I, it's actually, I think, one of my best ideas yet. Um, and uh, this is where having great colleagues is really important. Um, but our, our pilot work that we're funded for looks at uh, maternal immunization with COVID-19, Tdap, mm -hmm. and influenza. Oh, yeah. Um, maternal influenza infection. Um, and then the actual program project is going to have a component 
um, likely in Ghana, but could also be Kenya. There's two sites I'm working out of maternal schistosomiasis um, in addition to maternal infection and immunization um, in the U.S. Um, And so we're trying to really answer a very big picture question um, about what what is mom driven versus what is antigen driven. Um, And I just, um, we just, Lisa and I, uh, grad student, uh, just wrote a review about this. And and what what we know so far in the literature is that IL-6 really seems to be a marker of maternal inflammation um, across all models of infection um, (laughs) and uh, other inflammation um, and correlates with altered um, offspring outcomes, um, whereas IL-10 seems to be very specific to a few helmets, um, and, and there's likely other, other factors that are, are, are antigen-specific on, on other sides. Um, but we're really interested in understanding, ideally, um, markers that we can measure uh, both in the mom before she gives birth and in the cord blood to hopefully predict um, who is going to be immunomodulated because it's not, it's not every kid, right. Or else you'd have beautiful numbers, even when you have a 90 person study, right. (laughs) Um, it's not every kid. Um, and so we're, we're really interested in that. Um, we do have evidence for, uh, maternal cellular transfer, um, in our schistosomiasis model. Um, and I know Anna has that in other models as well. Um, so that's, I was curious when you say, when you mentioned that, are, are you saying, so maternal B and T cell transfer that are infected with the worms and transfer? Well, so, so, so immune cells can't be infected with worms, right? They're ginormous. Got it. Okay. <laughs> they're like, you <laughs> sure. know, they're, you're, you're, you're at hundreds of microns. Right. right, right. Um, so, um, no, they are antigen specific cells. Right. Okay. Yes. That are being transferred. Now they wouldn't cross the placenta. So are these breast milk uh, derived? Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Why do you think they don't cross the placenta? <laughs> well, it's, it is, you're right. It's something that I learned as like this dogma that only that antibodies dogma are crossing. So wrong. No, they find uh, <laughs> maternal cells circulating in children, right? Yeah. Yes. yes. And I, and I guess I never knew if those were breast milk derived because they, you know, there are some cells that enter through the intestine. We did originally have a hypothesis that they were mainly coming from the breast milk and uh, that, that doesn't appear to be the case. Okay. Um, interesting. So Do you think it's a, is, okay. uh, what we believe the largest component from the breast milk actually is are antibody antigen complexes. Right. Um, but we think the majority, so you can find There are cells in breast milk. It's not that there aren't. But we think the majority of cellular transfer is likely happening in utero. And Um, do you think that that depends on, like, during a schistosomiasis infection, is the placenta altered? Are there differential factors that lead to... So the best evidence for this comes from malaria. Um, And in malaria, the permeability of the placenta is greatly altered. Got it. Now, the caveat to that is that First of all, right, the placenta is actually infected, right? There are infected red blood okay, cells sure. in the placenta, right? right. Um, but uh, there is dysfunction of um, both the myeloid cells in, in terms of the really critical uh, macrophage component um, at the placental interface, um, as well as uh, the, the placenta itself in terms of bar- barrier function. Um, in japonicum, this has also been demonstrated um, and you have significantly more placental inflammation with japonicum, schistosoma japonicum than you do with either hematobium or mansoni. In hematobium and mansoni, there is very little human evidence for anything other than very mild inflammation. Um, I think there's literally 10 case reports that have demonstrated eggs at the placenta uh, with either hematobium or mansoni. Um, japonicum is a much more pathologic infection. Um, you know, on the scheme of things, hematobium, very, very, very mild. Mansoni, very, very medium. Japonicum, you know, you couldn't pay me millions of dollars to get infected with japonicum. It's just nasty. Um, and so uh, there are levels of inflammation and likely placental dysfunction with schistosomiasis. Um, 
but no evidence is that it's as dramatic as what you have with malaria. Um, that being said, our hypothesis is that this is, uh, is a direct cellular transfer and that you don't actually need a great dysregulation of placental barrier function because I think our, our visualization of the placenta as a barrier has always been wrong. It's a sieve, right? It filters, but it does not completely exclude. Um, and so I think the more we learn in various models, the more it becomes very clear that the placenta was likely always letting in certain things. Right. Um, and so we know what we've always had very good evidence for are our, our antibodies, right? And we actually know a mechanism, right? That's a placenta specific mechanism for transferring antibodies. Um, I don't know that I want to be the person that finds a placenta specific mechanism for transferring immune cells. Uh, I'm just working to prove that it happens in humans too. That would be um, but, fantastic <laughs> if you did. Wow. But we know that. we, we are, we are a hundred percent certain it happens in, in mice and that it's not only in schisto. Um, because as I said, Anna's lab has, has found the same thing. Um, <clears throat> one experiment we're, we're actually in the midst of right now that I'm really excited to see the outcome of. Um, we actually also think that uh, schistosome egg antigens are trafficked to the fetal liver. Um, and so mm. we have an experiment now. It means giving up a really good mom, which I always hate to do because you can't do a C-section on a mouse without killing a mom. But um, we have that experiment ongoing right now uh, to, to look at um, E14 fetal livers. Um, but uh, there is evidence from other colleagues with other models um, that uh, antigen itself is, also, is, is likely also trafficked uh, to the fetal liver. And we think that's one of the base mechanisms for uh, reprogramming of uh, B-cell hematopoiesis that we found. Um, but we, we have very, very strong evidence using three separate models um, that we can measure antigen-specific maternal cells being transferred uh, to the offspring. And that, that'll be not in the paper that Lisa's finishing up. It's in a paper by a postdoc. Um, but we're, we're very certain on that. I've done that awesome. all the ways I can think of doing it. <laughs> um, and we can, so you, we you, mentioned, you mentioned liver. And one of yes. the things we didn't talk about was once you incubate with this carrier and they go in the skin, what happens mm -hmm. after that? Because they, they, go through some reproduction and then they end up producing eggs and the eggs go to the liver and then there's Correct. a liver inflammation so, or? So, uh, yeah, in patent infection, um, after those cercari penetrate the skin, they uh, develop into what are called somules. So they lose their tail. They need their tail to actually be able to penetrate. Um, but it, after they do that, they lose their tail. Um, and then the first place they go is the lungs. Um, and they migrate through the lungs. They do cause mild inflammation, and so you can have wheezing uh, as 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 a side effect uh, during early migration. Um, and then they that's when they cross into capillaries, which um, trematodes uh, uh, like schist schistosomes uh, have to be in in the blood. Um, so trematodes are either in the lymph or they're in the blood. Um, here they're um, they're in the blood, um, and so that's when they uh, get into the bloodstream. Um, they have a very circuitous route uh, that isn't necessarily constant from infected animal to infected animal. Um, but uh, by the time that they are pre-adult, um, so L4 stage of larvae, um, they have to be in the portal vasculature if they're mansoni um, or japonicum. Um, and there they mature sexually. Um, and that's where they first pair. Um, we do know in animal models that they seem to be higher in the portal vasculature early on during pairing. And then um, as infection goes into chronic, they migrate further and further closer to the mesenteric vasculature. Um, but in a high dose infection, you'll find them everywhere. Um, and so uh, then they mate and they lay eggs. Um, the eggs want to end up coming out in the feces for Mance and I. Um, so they want to break a out across the lumen of the gut um, and be excreted in the feces. But blood, of course, flows up in every mammal. Um, and so 40 to 60-ish percent of them get lost in the liver because they never make it to the gut. 
because they can't fight against the blood flow. But they do, eggs actually have active mechanisms to migrate down uh, against the blood flow. flow. Um, and then they have active mechanisms in order to break out across the lumen of the gut. Wow. Yeah, that's um, specifically because, I, you know, the, an- the egg antigen dependency of the results in your papers, right. it's, it's interesting then to, to put that all in context with what you're saying and the mechanism. Yes. Of, and, right. and so there is, you know, there's 450-ish, depending on whose proteome it is you look at. <laughs> Uh, and we just did our own proteome recently. We've got 410 um, uh, antigens in an egg. Um, uh, only a subset of those are secreted, um, but it is a large subset that's secreted, again, uh, in various proteo- proteosomes. It's anywhere from 100 to 200 wow. antigens. 450. Um, I mean, that does make like viruses, like, you know, child's play. <laughs> Sorry, Vincent. I'm just uh, kidding. Yeah, of course. Not, but, not, you know, not that's giant, a lot of proteins. Not giant viruses. <laughs> Well, that's true. <laughs> that is true. Yes. Um, but yeah, and we we know what some of those antigens are, right? There's four very well characterized ones that are immunomodulatory. Um, two of them are also hepatotoxins. Um, and that's why you have to make a granuloma to survive, right? Because you you would lose all liver function to those hepatotoxins if you couldn't wall off the egg. Um, but because those antigens are secreted by the egg, um, plus you have eggs breaking down as a granuloma resolves, you can actually measure schistosome egg antigens in the blood. Um, and so you don't have to have, so con- going back to conceptually, right? You don't have to have an egg being deposited in the placenta in order to have egg antigen available to cross into an offspring, right? Because you have egg antigens being secreted and found in the bloodstream, right? Right. And you know the the mother's blood is connected to the fetal blood supply. You could have free antigens even without an active transport mechanism because you have antigens circulating. Um, but what we think happens is both this free antigen um, as well as an active cellular transport mechanism um, on the maternal side. And you think they just end up in the fetal liver just because again that's where the blood is being filtered, or do you think there's specific targeting? No, I, I think they end up there because that's where the, 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 the blood is being targeted. I mean, I think I could have a different hypothesis once we know uh, if that antigen pool is skewed one way or the other. Um, we won't know that on this first experiment. We're just looking for antigen in general. So we're using a very high titer chronic infection. Um, Do you think you need the infection the there or could you inject egg antigens and would they cross over and could you study the effects on the offspring? So that, that is the experiment that we're going to do instead of uh, AIM-3 in the grant. <laughs> um, so uh, we have to create two scenarios. So one is um, if all you do in a pregnant girl is infect schistosome egg antigens, you would never see immune complexes, right? Mm because you wouldn't have maternal antibodies that recognize those, right? Right. Um, And so the idea is to set up two scenarios where you have girls that are uh, twice vaccinated with uh, schistosome egg antigens, have high uh, titers and the ability to form immune complexes. Um, And we have assays to to measure immune complexes um, versus naive girls where they would never be able to generate immune complexes. Um, and then look at transfer across the placenta. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you need IgG to facilitate antigen transfer or mm-hmm. um, can you do enough? Now, the caveat to that experiment, of course, is that just injecting soluble egg antigens is not actually the same pool of antigens that would be circulating during infection, right? Because you're going to be skewed towards the, circula- the secreted of of antigens. And we don't have a way, a high throughput enough way to generate enough secreted pool of antigens um, to to really do those experiments, which is Mm -hmm. is one of the problems. And we can't just inject eggs because if you inject eggs into a naive host, they all go in the lung. Hmm. Wow. You actually, um, so granuloma formation in the liver um, can only happen in a primed host, right? And so in the context of a patent infection, you were exposed to a certain pool of antigens before eggs were ever 
uh, eggs were ever laid. So you have an immune primed system already. Got it. Um, But without that context, you don't form granulomas. Um, And because of circulation, right, um, things go through the lungs before they go to the liver, right, Um, when you inject into the bloodstream. Um, And so, and this is, this was published, you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, If you just inject IV eggs, they all end up in the lungs, um, which is not a good state. And they can't form a granuloma around them. And it's just, yeah, it's a bad state. Mm. Um, So we can't just inject eggs. It would, again, have to be a primed mother to be able to inject eggs. And then it's the question of, do you IV inject? Well, uh, I mean, circulation is all screwed up during pregnancy anyway. Um, (laughs) You know, so how how much that will mimic uh, the infected scenario, I, I think there would be a whole lot of caveats around that experiment. So I think the only way we can do it is the primed versus not primed to look for free antigen versus immune complexes, but know that those antigen pools are not going to be the same. Right. Um, so, so that's the way in which we think we can get at this question. Um, what I think is, is more important though, is that higher level question of antigen specificity versus maternal inflammation in general um, that I'm hoping we're going to have some answers to over, over the next um, three years. And so as part of that, we're moving into also a model of uh, influenza, maternal influenza infection. Um, and as I said, Anne already has models of, of, of Toxo. Um, the caveat with Toxo is you'll never get actual offspring. You can only get E14 pups, <laughs> um, but um, cause they spontaneously abort as right. what happens in humans. Um, so Yeah. So I, you know, pregnancy models are hard uh, in general, (laughs) getting back to one of your early questions. (laughs) Um, You know, it took, it took over a year to reliably get where we would know we will have X number of litters if we infect X number of girls. Mm, Um, And that's only true on the bulb seed background. It actually took us two years on the B6 background um, Mm. because B6, 70% of the girls spontaneously abort. Right. Um, in the, on the bulb seed background, it's less than a third. Um, and the bulb seed background seems to match humans a little better. Uh, if, if you look at first trimester miscarriage numbers, um, which there are caveats around that because that data isn't great in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, what is consistent though, is generally once they get past E7, we don't have a reabsorption. Um, and that's consistent. There doesn't seem to be any increase in third trimester abortions um, in humans in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and that's data I've pulled uh, from Kenya when I was looking for a site. And it also seems to be true in Ghana. There, there doesn't seem to be an increase in third trimester wow. um, miscarriages. Well, that, that program grant, that's very exciting. We're we'll looking forward to seeing work come out of that. That's very cool. Can I ask, um, do, do you yeah, think... These effects on the the offspring are accidental, or do they in some way benefit? Mm. Ah, there's a huge benefit. Yeah. Um, and so we've known for over 20 years um, that patent infection with helminths is protective against allergic and autoimmune diseases, and that's the full gamut from MS to atopic dermatitis. Wow. Um, Uh, And we've had data for about 15 years that suggests that children born to helminth infected mothers do also have reduced early childhood allergic disease. Hmm. Um, And we have to specify early childhood because generally by the age of five, all these kids are now also infected, right? So you've got a zero to five window where you have low levels of active infection um, in these kids. Um, So we've had that data for a while. Work out of uh, Clarissa Depari's group in Germany um, demonstrated that if offspring born to schistosoma mansoni infected mothers, this is in a mouse model, um, have uh, protection from allergic airway disease um, in induced models. Um, and I believe with Lisa's work, we have found the mechanism for that. Um, And so I told you that B-cell hematopoiesis is altered. Um, And so we have now demonstrated that there's a severe restriction in BCR repertoire 
for what gets into the periphery. Um, and what we think are lost are a whole lot of autoreactive clones. Wow. Because we actually have increased numbers of B cells before selection. Um, and then we have a dramatic reduction in the pool after selection in the bone marrow. Um, and then the outcome of that is restricted repertoire in the periphery. Um, so we believe what we're losing uh, in this reprogramming of B cell hematopoiesis is a lot of autoreactive B cell clones, which would be important for allergic airway disease, would also be important for atopic dermatitis um, and a lot of other autoimmune diseases. So that is absolutely fascinating. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so um, do you think that this change um, in the immune responses in the offspring is uh, kind of a general reduction in the immune reactivity or is it specific to kind of B cell related Ooh. responses? So that's, that's, that's an interesting question. So I'll give you part of the mechanism we found is that all light chain, chain genes are downregulated, which would of course affect both positive and negative selection. Right. Um, it would also then eventually, even for the things that had enough light chain to make it through selection, um, then also restrict your BCR repertoire. Um, because that's dependent on light chain diversity, right? Um, and so I think that that is part of it. Um, I do also believe in this theory, going back to evolutionary co-adaptation, that I know quite a few people in the microbiota field also have, which is that uh, your, your microbes are part of your self pool, right? And so I think it is twofold. And that you're affecting light chain, which then affects all of these things. Um, but that there is likely, and this is why the fetal liver experiment is very important, there is likely a pool of schistosome antigens that are present the same way self-antigens would be and would be used in the selection pool. Um, and so that's part of my leading hypothesis. I don't know if I'm yet right. I told you we, we just paired the girls five days ago. Um, <laughs> so in, in, uh, in, in seven more days, wow. we'll be giving them C-sections. We're sending um, good vibes your way. Thank you. Really <laughs> hoping they're all pregnant. Uh, it would be really bad <laughs> to take a mom that's not pregnant, um, which is why I've hesitated doing this experiment because we're only using good proven girls that are at chronic that we've already had three or four litters from. Wow. So we're, we're giving up good moms. Mm the sake of science. Um, but um, we're all very nervous about this experiment. So we're, we're actually, in addition to the, to the plugs for timing, we're actually going to weigh them. And if they're not at a weight that would suggest that they have a decent liver right. or a litter, we're not going to take them and we'll just, uh, we'll, we'll just pair again. Um, but yeah, but it's a really critical experiment for, for multiple reasons. Um, but I do fall in the camp of your microbial community is part of yourself, which, um, you know, there are lots of people in those, in this camp nowadays. Um, and I know I have colleagues even in, in type one diabetes field that are, are thinking about the microbiota as part of the pool of self and, and how that alters, um, you know, on the T cell side selection. Um, and so, you know, that, that's my camp. <laughs> um, and for me, it would have to all start at fetal liver, right? Because, um, the bone marrow itself isn't seated with progenitors, um, on, until fairly late in right. development. Right. And that seeding happens from the fetal liver itself, right? It's not a different pool of cells end up in the, in, in the bone marrow. Right. right. And so these are all coming from progenitors, um, from the fetal liver, um, it's so interesting to think about the fetal liver in terms of evolutionary immunology and how that organ evolved across the development of, of mammals. Um, but speaking to the evolution of helmets and the host and how we have been talking about them in, in a, a negative connotation in regards to the maternal model, but then, you know, the, the positive aspects of the shift in metabolism of certain cells. And, and, you know, we have however much time we have left a, a, a short segment. So we might not get to deep dive into this paper, but you found that macrophages derived from just a semi infected male mice had increased 
oxygen consumption, spare respiratory capacity. And that paper, I mean, I'm not in immunometabolism, so it was like dense for me to get through, but very I'm dense paper. Very dense, but but great. So curious your thoughts on uh, the, the the sex dependency and then how helmet infections can promote better metabolism. Yeah, so I I've got a working theory on that too. Um and we've actually we've taken down the first set of overectomized and castration experiments. Um, and actually my alternative hypothesis appears to be correct. Um, but, uh, at least one of them was right. Um, so, uh, but, um, so we'll take a step backwards. So, um, that reprogramming we know has to happen, um, at a long-term progenitor, right? Because CMPs and GMPs are short-term progenitors and their turnover is about 30 ish days. Right. And so the pivotal experiment in that paper was transferring bone marrow from male infected mice to uninfected mice, parking it for 10 weeks, taking it back out, and they still have the same phenotype. Right. That's crazy. Um, which means it can't be a CMP or a GMP because you wouldn't have had the same pool of CMPs and GMPs from your whole bone marrow transfer. Right. Now, there's lots of caveats in that experiment. One, it's a whole bone marrow transfer, it's not individual progenitors. That's the weakest thing. Um, two, we couldn't track them, um, because nobody any longer has, uh, a congenic APOE model. Um, Gwen used to have one. It was lost in an accident, um, in a breeding accident. Um, and so none of us have it anymore. Um, and so it was that, you know, that is probably the weakest part of that paper, uh, because all we could do is show that we had depleted circulating uh, myeloid cells, which we did by by bleeding them, by bleeding the mice serially, and that they, they did come back after six weeks, hmm. right? So, um, but I will ag- I will admit, and I said this in the discussion, it is quite likely that those were not a hundred percent chimeras; that they were, you know, whether it's 90, 10, 80, 20, right? So it's not a super clean experiment. Um, our goal is to transfer individual trackable progenitors. Um, and we're working to that. But in order to do that, we need to switch to the LDLR system, um, which is another model of metabolic disease where they get atherosclerosis. Okay. Um, we have, they can also get diabetes. We've just shown that we can get them diabetic in our facility um, as, as well as obese. Um, and so uh, I have a colleague, Jesse Williams, uh, at the University of Minnesota, that has uh, has a myeloid trackable uh, congenic uh, LDLR system that we will be switching to soon, hopefully. Um, and so that's the only way we're going to prove a hundred percent that it was a progenitor that came from a schistosome infected mouse. Hmm. Um, that being said, the circumstantial evidence was still really strong <laughs> um, because they had the exact exact same fatty acid oxidation phenotype when we took the bone marrow out, right? Um, so I felt fairly confident in saying the majority of those cells came from the infected bone marrow, not the uninfected bone marrow, since the control chimeras were still dysfunctional, right? Um, so, um, so yes, it does appear uh, to be at the progenitor level. Um, and in terms of what progenitor it is, you know, we're still working on that. We're waiting for our, our single cell RNA seq of uh, progenitors to come back um, from males versus females. Um, and so our fingers are crossed that we're going to have a subcluster because I actually, we don't think it's every cell that's reprogrammed. Um, we actually think that it's a heterogeneous population when you're in the bone marrow of infected mice. Um, and I can explain why, but, uh, we, yeah, we don't think it's a, a, a uniform reprogramming. Um, but so we think we're, we're hoping to see, uh, clusters within each progenitor cluster that will, um, signal the likelihood to develop the phenotype we have in mature macrophages, right? Because it's not going to be the exact same transcripts because the metabolism of progenitors is very different from the metabolism of, of a mature myeloid cell. Um, but we do have targets that we think should be conserved at the progenitor level um, that we will be looking at. Um, and yes, that is biological sex dependent. This doesn't happen in females. Um, our hot off the press data 
that uh, we still don't have the, we'll have this week, we'll have the uh, cellular metabolism data. But uh, at a whole body level, if you overectomize a girl, it now phenocopies a male. Hmm. Very cool. Hmm. Very cool. So, so. Well, this is also awesome. I, I'm I'm learning so much <laughs> and enjoying so much. Um, so, are there any um, sort of similar types of findings in um, humans um, in terms of metabolic changes after a uh, schizosome infection? Uh, yes. So globally, uh, in every country it's been looked and with every helminth that's been looked at, there is an inverse correlation between metabolic disease and helminth infection. Mm. This is true for filarial worms. This is true for ascaris. This is true for schisto. Mm. Um, so it doesn't matter what component you are in the body, right? Whether you're in the lymphatics, the vasculature, or the gut, um, you're likely protected from metabolic disease. Um, now, there are lots of caveats to that. The strength of this correlation um, does vary in geographic regions. Um, there are also uh, at least two papers in one specific area that have shown that this correlation is only true for uh, the higher end of body weight and not true for lean to start individuals. Um, but that hasn't been replicated in other locations. Um, so how widespread that phenomenon is, is, is not known. Um, but what has been replicated for over two decades now is this really strong correlation. Um, and so mechanistically, we know that this is also true in, in urine models, right? You can both protect from disease and you can revert disease, uh, with helminth infections, a uh, whole body metabolic disease. Um, and, and so it, this does appear to be a true thing. Um, I'm hoping to, in the next six months, be able to test some of our targets, uh, that we have in, in, in myeloid cells, um, from PBMCs, uh, in a couple of different locations. Um, but we're still working on that. Um, but yes, it does appear to be true in humans. I'm curious, how do you separate diet from immune mechanisms and so forth because so <laughs> they, these these people live in very very different parts of the world they have different um nutritional status they have different diets and how do you distinguish between what's actually an immune phenotype versus what might be some sort of environmental effect as yeah, well yeah and that is that is hard and that likely explains um you know, the variability in the data, mm. right? Along with genetics. Um, because we do also know that at least from the genetic targets that we have found in myeloid cells that we've published, um, a, a, you know, polymorphisms in some of those same targets that we've found that are modulated in males and not modulated in females or modulated the opposite direction in females. Mm. Um, there is data in the literature that polymorphisms in those genes are associated with disease in various human populations. And that's true in uh, the largest studies are, are either Chinese studies mm -hmm. um, because of the, heter uh, the homogeneity of, of genetic populations there. Um, but this has also been found in some sub-Saharan African studies. Um, so, Mechanistically, I think we're on the right track, mm -hmm. um, but you're right that there are differences. One important thing to understand, at least with schistosomes, because we've done this experiment, is that it doesn't require high fat diet and it's not dependent on the genetic background of the, of the animal. And so, you know, it was in a supplement because <laughs> uh, it was asked for by a reviewer, but we published IL-4 receptor flox, flox, Cree negative mice, um, males. Um, they have the exact same fatty acid oxidation phenotype. Mm -hmm. um, from a transcript level in our maternal model, if we develop, if we generate macrophages from the bone marrow of an offspring born to a schistosome infected mother, we have the exact same modulation in SLC1A3, which is the glutamate receptor. Wow. Um, so it's not dependent on genetic background. It's not dependent on diet. Hmm. Um, I think it's really consistent. Yeah, let's do one one question each more. Sure, go ahead. Steph. Um, okay, so 
I think uh, my question was really the, 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 I love this broader question of, of evolution, co-adaptation. And so did you see sex specific differences in the maternal model? So in the pups? Yep. Okay. And okay. that is super key to Lisa's next paper. Okay. Got it. Up. Okay. <laughs> and Great. we believe we have the sex dependent mechanism for it. Oh, sweet. Yes. Sweet. There is sex dependency in... Hey, because with the, with the pups, then you can really investigate, like, because they're pre-pubital. So the, it's, so not it's, yeah, right, it's, it's not spoiler, hormones. Yeah. Right. It's not hormones. It's not hormones. Then it's like <laughs> X-linked genes. Yep. I, I'm assuming that's it. Okay, cool. Cool. Huh. Awesome. <laughs> I was curious how infection with something else on top of schisto affects any of this. Ah, so uh, yes. That is a grant I'm still trying to get funded. Um <laughs> In the uh, vein of evolutionary code up adaptation, I had right. submitted this for a, a transformational R01 and it didn't get funded. So we're finishing up to get some more preliminary data now to put it in as a traditional R01. Um, but that grant looks at competition with another uh, co-evolved pathogen mm-hmm. versus competition with an emerging or emerged, newly emerged pathogen. Um, so yes, we are very interested in the interplay because we know a lot of pathogens can reprogram progenitors, right? That's been yep. demonstrated. Yep. Um, and so we're very interested in the interplay between that. And there is some really intriguing data in the epidemiological literature, right? And so we know that schistosome-infected individuals or kids born to schistosome-infected mothers are more susceptible to TB. Mm. They're protected from malaria, particularly cerebral malaria. So the most severe forms of malaria. Um, But then they're much more susceptible to um, diarrheal diseases and and upper respiratory tract infections, right? And those are the leading cause of deaths of children under five in Helminth and Debeck areas. Um, And so, and if you think of TB is another co-evolved pathogen, right? Mm. Malaria. It's definitely a co-evolved pathogen. We have entire SNPs, right, that <laughs> are evolved solely to be protective from the development of severe malaria, right? Yep. Um, and so versus uh, upper respiratory tract and, and intestinal bacterial and viral infections, right, are, are much more emerging mm-hmm. pathogens in terms of the scheme of evolution, right? Hmm. So um, I do have a whole nother set of aims we're working on with that, uh, with with other co-evolved versus uh, emerging pathogens. Brianne? So I only have about 400 questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but We're going to have you back. I think that's what it, this means. The, the one that I'll go with is um, in your um, immunometabolism model, um, does the timing of uh, schistosome exposure relative to metabolic changes matter? So for example, if you have already had some of these negative metabolic changes from obesity or glucose intolerance, are they reversed by schistosome infection or is it simply that this is protective? Uh, Both things occur. So we've done both a true regression model, um, which is they were on high fat diet for five weeks before they were infected. Um, And then the model that we have published um, and that we do the most is uh, protection from, but still with a little bit of regression. And that's um, most of what we published. Actually, I think all of what we published in this PLOS pathogens paper. And then most of what we published in the paper before that in 2018, um, they were on high fat diet for 10 days before they were infected. Um, that is actually still enough high fat diet that when you give them a GTT at five weeks post-infection, which is before egg laying starts, they are all diabetic. So they all become obese and they all become diabetic. And then after egg laying starts, they now uh, become sensitive to to glucose and insulin again, um, and they lose body fat. Um, What they lose the most is the abdominal um, (laughs) fat. Um, So it is both protective and a regression model. In our regression model, um, we still had reduced plaques when they were on high fat diet for five weeks um, before they were infected. It's just the effect was less than, you know, 
when, when it's earlier, but uh, we're pretty sure both regression and prevention, prevention happens. But in every single experiment we publish, we give them a five-week GTT and we know that they're diabetic before egg laying starts. And then by 10 weeks, they're not diabetic. Wow. All right. So my question is, are we in some future time looking at treating women for schistosome infections before pregnancy or birth? That is actually what I advocate. Yes. So is it before you even get pregnant or or just before birth? uh, Before pregnancy. Um, So right now, most uh, deworming policies in almost all countries focus on kids for many reasons, right? right? right. Um, It is the most bang for your buck in terms of improving morbidity, right? So cognition, growth, all of those things, you know, you get the most bang for your buck by, by treating kids. Um, and, and resources are limited. So you can't fault most countries for this, right? They don't have an unlimited supply of money to buy quantal. Um, so that's where, where treatment has targeted and it leads to most kids are not treated after about the age of nine or 10. Right. And, and you're thinking that, uh, puberty for girls will happen by 13. Um, in a lot of these countries, by 16 or 17, they might be having their first pregnancy, right? Um, and so if their last time they were treated was at 9 or 10, they're chronically infected by the time they get pregnant the first time. Hmm. That's just the facts, right? Uh, adults are not magically protected from infection because they were infected as kids. You know, they they have lower worm burdens, um, which is is likely why all of these most of these infections are subclinical, right? Because most countries do have a policy to treat women that are infected um, if they're pregnant, if they're symptomatic, right? But they're not testing every single pregnant woman for schistosomiasis or any other helmet, right? They, again, don't have the resources to do that. Um, So my, from a policy standpoint, what I advocate for is that there should be universal treatment um, into the childbearing years. Um, from another standpoint, there are, are groups of people that are advocating that as actually the only way we're going to eliminate schistosomiasis. Um, and so the SCORE project, uh, uh, which here is headed by, um, here in the U.S., is headed by um, Dan Colley and, and Evan Secor, um, has, has demonstrated a really high prevalence in uh, adults Right. And the few countries that have started to try to treat adults, um, you know, much more globally um, have also found that there's a very high prevalence in adults. And so you can't eliminate just the if you don't eliminate that pool of um, eggs going into into the water. Right. Um, and so. My my policy is. I wouldn't treat, and if I was infected with schisto, I wouldn't actually want prosequantal treatment during pregnancy. I would want uh, infection eliminated before I got pregnant. Right. Well, whoever makes prosequantal should do a Merck and donate large quantities. So it is It is the German Merck. The German ah. Merck makes prosequantal. Oh. Um, and they actually do donate a large quantity annually. Great. It's they don't do nothing. So I don't want oh. people... <laughs> leaving here thinking that they do nothing okay. for, for the schistosomiasis uh, community. No, they actually, uh, they, they donate a lot. And they've actually worked to develop a form of prosequantal that's better absorbed by children because absorption in kids is very, very, very poor. And so the efficacy of prosequantal overall is in the 80s-ish uh, and it's much lower in kids because it's very poorly absorbed. Um, and And so they've actually worked specifically, and again, they're not making a profit off of this, right? Sure, so sure, sure. they've worked specifically to develop a form that is more easily absorbed by kids. Okay, um, so they are actually, they're, they're trying to do a lot for the cause. Excellent. Um, but yeah, no, this has to be a, a global investment of, of money and, and energy. Um, All right. That is uh, immune number 49. Show notes, microbe.tv slash immune. You can send us questions, immune at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guest today from the University of Utah, Kiki Fairfax. Totally wonderful, fascinating stuff. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University. Cindy Leifer on Twitter. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. 
Steph Langle, Duke University, Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, thanks. This is great. And thanks for arranging this. This was your show. Sure. Really yes, absolutely. We yeah. need to do it again. Brianne Barker is a Drew University bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. Now let me go rearrange my immunology syllabus to talk about all the things I learned today. So, Brianne, yeah. often you say, I'm going to start working on this. Is that the case here? You're going to start working on pregnant mice? <laughs> no, I don't think I'm going to start working on pregnant mice, but I do think that I'm going to um, change a couple of uh, readings for yeah. later in my semester in all immunology. Right. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month. Mm -hmm.